What were the key musical moments in your life in terms of repertoire, composers, people? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, inter interestingly enough, uh, I think those key moments are not uh, connected with recorder <laughs> at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the cello. Mm -hmm. um, so, if I just you know, pick moments a bit at random, uh, you easily get to you know sort of your favorite composers or composers that have or musical events that have played a a role, um, and there is no. Uh, there's really no explanation uh, why. Uh, why this happens. So you can sort of think about it for the rest of your life. So why is it? I mean, I'm a, I'm a Brucknerian. I, I love you know, Bruckner. I've always uh, loved Bruckner. My grandfather was a great uh, lover of Bruckner. And mm. uh, whether that's a reason or not, but I, I remember very much the, the first time that I mm. heard probably the Seventh Symphony or so. It had you know, enormous impact. I mean, this is a bit what we are talking about. These moments that uh, yeah. something hits you like a brick. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing happened at some point when I was actually already uh, in conservatory. Uh, I heard a, a recording of uh, music by Dufay, you know, which I had never heard before, and there was only a very little, again, uh, going around you know, in terms of requests of Dufay and uh, that was also, also was a yeah, music that is so characteristic uh, mm. of itself mm. uh, that it, you know, it, it rang all sorts of uh, bells. Mm. Um, it had happened uh, earlier on with, uh, with Otter Ter, you know, although that seems uh, sort of a uh, strange uh, another field but there was I when I for the first time played this duet you know there is this duo suite yeah, and I played it with my teacher mm. and again and I played you know, all sorts of other Telemann and all the other duos but um, and it was the first time there was and it was the only sort of Otter that was on the market so yeah. to speak uh, not even to listen to but just uh, in sheet music mm. And we played that, and I was, I was fascinated. Mm. I thought this is something. This is different, mm. and that you know, sparked the whole research into French music because yeah. it was just because of a single piece that just sort of hits the hits the spot. Um, well, further along, as I said at the beginning, um, I, uh, I at home you know, as a you know, when I was small. Uh, we listened to music uh, a lot, uh, and but I was uh, I grew up with uh, with uh, with a lot of opera, you know, mm. Strauss and uh, Alban Berg, you know, of all uh, composers. So I was uh, I, I grew up with very heavy duty uh, operatic repertoire. Yeah, yeah. But all this early twentieth century, nineteenth century music, which then you pretty much. Never played, right? No, because but do you do on the wrong with, with a recorder? <laughs> it's just not. That's not. Yeah. Uh, it's not happening. But yeah, uh, that doesn't mean that it still you know, plays an enormous role in my you know, musical uh, brain. And your feeling, right? It's there. Yeah. yeah, I know these pieces. You know, backwards. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's. Uh, and what about Schubert? And Schubert um, is a, was also an early. I heard that a lot uh, at home because uh, because my mom being a pianist so. I got familiar with the Impromptus and the, uh, the Moment Musico, and then, then another. That was another key moment that because I was, I was very much uh, uh, fixated on Schubert. Um, mm. Schubert did something to me that other composers from that period uh, don't. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, yeah, so the, the the so I was very familiar with the piano music, and so there was at that point in time, again this was in nineteen sixty seven or so. There was one 
recording of the complete uh, piano sonatas, mm -hmm. all, all the piano sonatas, uh, by a, an obscure Austrian pianist called Friedrich Wuer, and it was a Vox, it came from America, it was a Vox box, and I found it in a, yeah, in a record shop. Yeah. Uh, complete, yeah, complete sonatas. Mm. It has been a, you know, incredible, uh, had an incredible impact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Schubert, I, I'm working at the moment on on Schubert's songs and it sort of feels almost a little pointless to try and speak about something which is so, so sublime, so special. Mm. But what, if you were to try, what it, what is it about Schubert? What is, what is it? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of impossible to, to pinpoint, right? Yeah, you cannot. It's you cannot analyze it the way you can say, oh, okay, his modulations or his melodies or his yeah. yeah. But it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't explain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and um, we have to talk about Bach. Yes. Why is he the ultimate mind fucker? <laughs> and there's a there's a second part of the question mm. which we can get onto. Often. Yeah, but what do you think? Um, with Bach, um, of course, I was also you know, uh, very familiar at an early time because in Holland, you know, we have the 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 say Matthew's Passion tradition, which now has spread over the, around the globe, and so you can hear the. St. Matthew's Passion at every day of the week. Mm. Um, but of course, at that, at that point, for some reason in Holland, there was this very, very uh, strong tradition of having, you know, in the Easter time, we would have the St. Matthew's Passion on the radio and um, mm. in the Concertgebouw. And, uh, and of course, yeah, that is an uh, inescapable uh, musical experience, however badly performed, you know, uh, certainly, the first performances that I heard you know, had nothing to do with anything that was historically informed. But uh, as it is with Bach, you know, his music overrides you know, basically anything. And uh, yeah, that is probably that is his main. Uh, that's where his main characteristic lies. There is something in his writing which uh, is above and beyond uh, the. Uh, the way that it is is reproduced, mm. um, of course, done yeah, in the correct way. Yeah, you add yeah, you you add enormously to yeah, to aspects of it. But the music is in itself is is indestructible. Mm. Yeah, which for a lot of other music uh, cannot be said. Yeah, so it means there is a. There is in the composition, you know, in the notes themselves, there is something so elementary uh, mm. that uh, that it cannot be uh, alienated uh, mm. in one way or another. Mm. Well, the second part uh -huh. of the question is to do with Guillaume de Macho, who I seem to remember at some point you telling me that you considered him the only the only person you could put in the same kind of category as Bach in this sense of of kind of overriding everything or maybe that wasn't the sense but somehow no, that, you considered them equals in some way yeah. or another well that i think where they are equal uh, is more in their historical uh, position uh -huh. um in the sense that these these are two figures that single-handedly uh, basically changed the the course of musical history. I see. I mean their Im their impact yeah on everything that happened afterwards yeah is so enormous uh, that yeah they're they're key figures mm -hmm. yeah and uh, they're the the of course you can you can see elements uh, in their style, in their way of, of composition, uh, in their writing, elements that are present uh, in, in composers just, just before them, uh, in, in the tradition before them. But the way that they manipulate that uh, 
present material yeah, into something that is so yeah, substantially new mm. and open and breaks open so many roads you know, into uh, unexplored mm -hmm. areas that I think is, is unique for both, mm. both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's why I consider them uh, equals you know, in that particular uh, aspect. A lot of people won't know much about Masha. What, where would you point them to, to sort of become familiar with, with his music? Well, that's difficult because, of course, uh, Masha is a medieval <laughs> composer, um, and one of the uh, one of the difficulties uh, in the in to approaching uh, high high society <laughs> yeah, uh, art music from the Middle Ages is that it is so linked uh, also to uh, to literature to poetry and of course we know that um, Machel was a was principally uh, uh, a poet mm -hmm. and regarded as such yeah and secondly a composer yeah but that of course uh, in the course of time uh, we have seen that, that his musical influence is so gigantic uh, but yeah, if you approach uh, that music, you have to have a certain grip also on the, yeah, on the on the poetry and on the old French, yeah, and that this is one of the key uh, problems uh, why that still um, a serious approach to to music from Machot, yeah, and then a century onwards is uh, is, is stagnating. Is that you need so much cultural baggage? Yeah. Uh, to actually get you know, any understanding of what is going uh, going on, yeah. you know, and that's part of the teaching uh, of of all these medieval classes. It is always just always departing from the text and say, okay, what is this about? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I interpret that? How does the verse uh, work? And in order to get any you know, any interpretation um, mm -hmm. working, you know, so that would be a big difference from. From something like Bach, where you know, of course, well, we, yeah, well, if you if you understand all the texts, of course, you get so much out of it. But yeah. many people listen without listening to the text, or, yeah. they, or they listen to instrumental music, and it's you know, it changes their lives. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to medieval music shortly because there are lots of uh, questions I have about that. But um, going back to the theme of of kind of music that's been important to you in your life let's talk about 60s and 70s yeah rock. we hadn't we hadn't arrived we hadn't arrived there yet jefferson airplane yes jimmy hendrix you were massively into all that stuff and yes. you probably, probably still are yes um what's what is it about that music that you love it, uh, of course it, um in in pop music, uh, what we call pop music, um, in the sixties, uh, of course, there was also a, a a revolution, and I think the revolution was basically that um, from being pop music in the sense of you know just entertainment, um, uh, it became something else, mm. uh, and. The, the split you know, between classical music and entertainment happened somewhere in, I think, in the 19th century, maybe in the 18th century, uh, where the two th things became two different uh, categories of, of listening. Mm -hmm. um, so you got light music and you got serious music. And this, yeah, um, it, probably that also existed in the Middle Ages, but we don't know anything about it because it was not written down. Yeah. And uh, it's of a completely different uh, nature. Mm. Um, anyway, so this the interesting part is that in the sixties there was a reverse of the of the process, and suddenly, yeah, and I think the Beatles are largely yeah, responsible for that. Mm. Um, Pop music yeah, became a serious genre on all levels, yeah, on musical levels, on textual levels, uh, and this all happened yeah, in the yeah, in the in the second half of the sixties, uh, and that yeah for me as a musical person uh, immediately yeah, sparked interest. I was not listening to the Ronettes or to the 
yeah, I wasn't listening to Elvis and I wasn't listening to I mean, because I I wasn't interested, Little Richard, whatever. But of course, yeah, when the Beatles arrived, you know, mm. something uh, very serious happened there. Yeah, yeah it it completely changed. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, th th that particular side of music yeah and that then you know ex exploded you know if you now look at it and you see in how little time mm. you know how much happened there mm. um, is staggering yeah that's uh, practically unprecedented right yeah how much happened in how in in less than 10 years in terms of development yeah. did you ever play any of that music <coughs> no but you played bass right yeah, but that was just a... For fun? Yeah, it was for fun, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I never played in a band, but... Still could happen. It still could happen, yeah. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, there you have but, it, yeah. Facebook are open for, <laughs> for bookings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, what what's it been like... Um, let's talk about Jill. Yeah. Jill Feldman, who's your partner and singer and friend of mine as well. Um, you've been living together, making music together, listening to the Grateful Dead together. I guess that music was one point of connection. Be Serious. Between yeah. the two of you. Yeah. Uh, but tell me a little about, a little bit about that and how it was to, to, uh, to, to play all this, all this medieval music together in Tetractis, your ensemble, and just the two of you, you went on tour just in duo, recorder and voice. That's quite a, extreme and fiddle right yeah tell me about that yeah so we started uh with malapunica with this medieval group that's how we sort of re-met because we have met now uh, incidentally mm. in uh, 10 years before that as in a recording one of the first recordings of uh, les arts florissants mm -hmm. uh, where she was uh, one of the the the, the founding members mm. Um, anyway, so that recording uh, passed and there was no further uh, contact. Then we re-met in Malapunica and um, yeah, as things go in life, I, was, I had one relationship that was ending and um, yeah, we got slowly got uh, closer mm -hmm. and um, found out about you know, common origins. I had been you know, a lot to California and mm -hmm. she's from, uh, from L.A. And um, we started, uh, so we played medieval music in Malapunica. Then we both left Malapunica um, and decided to, uh, together, to start our own uh, CD label mm. with all of music. Uh, specifically because we, you know, I had some plans. Uh, I wanted to uh, explore some of this medieval uh, minimal music instead of in the sense of you know, just playing two voice music yeah. with a, just a voice and an instrument. Yeah. Uh, and that was our first uh, project together. Mm. And then, yeah, we did a series of projects. We did uh, concerts, uh, songs mm -hmm. where I played the viol and the just birds and uh, mm -hmm. contemporaries, English music. So that was again was an old, you know, you know an old love for the for the English Renaissance and yeah. playing the viol. And so finally, I found a way oh, to uh, yeah. to explore that one. Right, because uh, you had your well, own label. I had my own label. You had, you had a singer. Yeah. You had your instrument, yeah. and you just needed to find a few other people. Yeah, and we played together with the Concerto de, de Le Viole with Roberto Gini, mm. uh, and that was a that worked very well. Yeah, but um, she was also into big, big time into the Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin. Yes, I guess so because music. she grew up with that, um, and I had for some reason, yeah. Again, I got very much into the. <laughs> to West Coast uh, rock, yeah, acid rock or whatever they call it, um, yeah. Which because I, it's, it's again, you know, it's like what happened with Dufay or with other things. I heard the first uh, Jefferson Airplane, mm. and I said, "Oh, this <laughs> is again, you know, it's this is something completely different, uh, you know, dif different from the Beatles, different from those developments." 
and uh, yeah so there there you go and uh, so we then discovered that we both uh, came from that because i of course immediately explored everything i listened mm -hmm. to everything that was mm -hmm. uh, got on the market mm -hmm. and so became, do you still listen to music occasionally yeah but is there a point where you sort of you've had enough enough input yeah yeah but your head gets very full <laughs> yeah <laughs> because it's it, it's everything you know i would listen to everything yeah, yeah. and uh, and mixing everything yeah so another thing you guys love is bluegrass yeah that's and, more recent yeah. and that's a, and you've made a connection in one of your uh, medieval editions so so olive music as well as being a record label also publishes um incredible ed editions of medieval music um which are all on your website um there's a connection between these istampitas and bluegrass this is quite a specific question but let's yeah, just okay. let's just talk about it briefly because mm. it, it, it could be interesting um, yeah, it's one of the key, uh, one of those key questions of the many key questions with uh, you know, just a, a minuscule part of uh, of medieval uh, music culture. Mm. Um, but it be it came a little bit uh, close to home. Um, it's these istampitas, um, in a sense that you know, it is it's one of the, since it's almost the only written instrumental. Um, solo repertoire from uh, medieval times. Mm -hmm. um, of course, every recorder player you know, just jumps uh, on these estampitas and it becomes part of the recorder repertoire. Yeah. Uh, but of course, you know, being a recorder teacher and you know, a recorder person, uh, you say, fine, you know, this is good to learn something about medieval music and play these pieces. On the other hand, as a researcher and as a medievalist, I say, well, you know, the... the <laughs> The probability uh, that this is a recorder piece, you know, mm. sort of over the years diminishes to about one percent. Right. And um, so, uh, at some point, you have to you know, come up with an uh, with an alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that again is something we didn't talk about, but I should just briefly say that one of the uh, of the dry, of the the key uh, methods, if you like, in in research is the first thing you have to do is categorically exclude everything that has to be categorically excluded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to say in medieval music, the use of the double bass, yeah, <laughs> you can exclude, yeah. Sure. And the use of the trumpet, yeah. But you can so you narrow it down to so okay, everything that is uh, that you can sort of forget you should forget, yeah? not even think, you know, think of it as a, as a possibility. So in terms of instruments, this is specifically based on a lot of iconography yeah. where you see... It's just what you can you see. see yeah. in, you see basically all the instruments that, yeah. that existed. Yeah, because there's, physically there's nothing left. And none zero. of them no, are big enough nothing. to produce the tones that no. a double bass produces. No. So, that's a, yeah, so that poses immediately a very serious question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, to return to the Istampitas, mm. so the you you get yeah you at some point you say okay it's I have to actually exclude the reality of a recorder as a solo instrument for this repertoire being a solo repertoire. Um, because but why why specifically do you exclude that? That it's solo repertoire. That it's a recorder solo piece. Well, because there is there is no the recorder was not a very important mm. yeah, player. Mm. Uh, if again, yeah, if you look at the uh, iconography, yeah, you will have whatever 150 uh, yeah, images of a viola mm. uh, against three of a recorder. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your statistics. And harps. Um, right? eh? Harps. And harp, the tons of yeah. harps uh, and organettos. And mm. so, so the recorder was not so, so important. Uh, and there's no single image of somebody you know, playing the solo recorder. Yeah, if anything, it's in an ensemble with other instruments. Really? There's yeah. no image of that? No, absolutely not. Yeah. So, so the Istampita, you speculate that it's more of a collective piece. 
Yeah, because yeah, most of the image, the imagery uh, are is is built um, is composed of ensembles. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are not, you don't see very much solo mm -hmm. uh, work. It's always ensembles, and moreover, uh, ensembles of uh, heterogeneous ensembles. I mean, there are always different instruments, sure. not instruments of one family. Yeah, yeah. So there is no recorder consort or a fiddle consort or any consort. It's all separate instruments with. Of course, then you find out is linked to the fact that the repertoire is also like that. Yeah. So you have the three voices you know, in a in a in a, in a, in a song, mm. and they're 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 dramatically different in writing yeah. styles. Yeah. So you can see it's for different types of instruments mm -hmm. or voices. Um, so then. The next step is to say, okay, these these Istanbulis have a specific, a very strange sort of rondo form um, with a sort of a refrain which comes back, and then um, what they call the prima pars, or they call a punctum. They say, okay, then you get a sort of a new material which then at some point links up back to the yeah. to the refrain, and then you do that, you do that over and over again, and then you go to the next one and the next one, the next one, and these. These various uh, beginnings, yeah, um, again, they're very different in in writing. Yeah. yeah. So between the prima pars and the segunda pars and the terza pars and the quarta pars, uh, you say, hey, this this is a very different, uh, it's different music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the next thing is that have to me that sounds like it's almost like it's it's written for a different instrument, mm -hmm. yeah, a different an instrument with a different nature or mm -hmm. characteristics. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so then you go back to the concept. You say, well, most of this, the music, what I see, I don't see solo pictures. Uh, mm. So it's it's more likely that uh, we're talking about a, a group of musicians, mm. which I can actually see, often, more often than not, angel musicians, you know, but always a group of musicians. And, well, then by sort of coincidence i was i got interested in bluegrass so, so we started with and uh there is this group which is uh, very successful at the moment they're called the the infamous string dusters and um that they're uh, of this new generation of bluegrass players which are you know extremely accomplished instrumentalists mm. and uh and create yeah, new yeah. styles, new forms. And what I, what struck me was, uh, of course, you say, hey, a bluegrass band is actually, it's one violin and it's a banjo and it's a dobro and it's a guitar and it's a bass uh, and there's no percussion. <laughs> Um, yeah, this, so this is a, an ensemble of five different instruments. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not dissimilar to what I see in an angel's musician's painting mm -hmm. yeah, from the 14th century. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's a different period. So but, in your head, it kind of went click. Well, something click, clicked. Click. Then yeah. I said, but and they, you know, they do, of course, do songs. Uh, and then every now and then they play an instrumental. Mm with the same instruments. Yeah. yeah. And so I said, so what if, you know, if you have these same instruments and at some point you know, the singing stops. Yeah. Another aspect is that so this instrumentalist and the singers yeah, uh, are the same. And of course, as we know, the bluegrass, the, the singers in bluegrass bands are incredibly good singers. Yeah. yeah. It's unbelievably. Yeah. Yeah, good, well-trained singers, mm. and um, and then it struck me that when they played their instrumentals, mm. uh, it was a completely different uh, music or form mm -hmm. from when they sing the songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you know, I, there was one of those instrumental pieces. I said, but this form, the form they use with this refrain kind of uh, and the different back, yeah. solos yeah, of the way. That is that's an estampita, mm -hmm. yeah. Because you would have the yeah you would have the yeah with the guitar solo you would have the mandolin solo with the banjo solo yeah. and always returning yeah to the 
yeah, where everybody plays together and does yeah. the sort of refrain. Well, at that uh, that struck me as a very uh, as a piece of information. Yeah, I said, what about you know, mm. uh, if this was actually and what was going on? Has that ever been tried with this tomatoes? <coughs> I needle? think yeah, partially. Uh, uh -huh. that some groups uh, mm. also Malapunica, yeah, they try to to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit from different. Uh, point of view without or, the bluegrass uh, uh, yeah without <laughs> influence this, yeah yeah okay and what is it about percussion there's a sort of uh, you, you made a point of saying that in bluegrass there's no percussion and i know that in medieval music you're not really so keen on percussion percussion instruments. yes why why not okay well um let's say percussion as we understand it in Western music, yeah, or as it is um, applied to medieval music, you know, if it is applied to medieval music, uh, is always to underline some sort of pulsating rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always starts with pom, 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 beam, pom, 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 and then starts the, the fiddling around, yeah, and the fluting around. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, the way that you know, medieval music developed yeah, is from rhythmically amorphous Gregorian chant for centuries yeah, to the first yeah, coagulating of yeah, some sort of rhythm in, in organum mm -hmm. uh, in order to be... Uh, organum, to, just tell people what that is. Yeah, uh, organum, so when. Is, yeah, so we're now in the, sort of the, the middle of the 12th century. Uh, and you st it's the first time that you start singing you know, polyphonically. You know, of mm -hmm. course, there's no, uh, nobody's playing percussion in the church. Um, but they found out a way to sing polyphonically by you know, splitting uh, one voice in like in parallel, singing in parallel il intervals. Mm -hmm. And the next step was doing that over a drone, sort of over a lying uh, tenor line. So, um, and yeah, so this made it necessary to uh, to develop some sort of notation uh, in order to organize the rhythm of the various voices and as soon as they you know, got some grip on that notation um, it enabled them to start experimenting more with the independence uh, of the two voices mm -hmm. so this is a you know, this is a very important um, cause oh, and right. effect thing is that you you, you create a notation to notate something you're doing, yeah? but then the notation itself becomes, yeah, gives you the possibility to experiment yeah, on levels, um, yeah. which brings you yeah, further in performing. Uh, and so the whole thing That's a huge snowballed. topic in, and it reached great extreme levels, right? It, yeah. Later medieval music. But so what, just to be clear for, for, for people who are not so familiar with this, the terminology, what you're saying is that before that, in, in Gregorian chant, there was no sense of pulse whatsoever. No, no, it's, it's free flowing, it's free flows. flowing. It's yeah. almost, it's still, it's, it's like, um, I mean, there are many examples of, of music that exist that still has that quality. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so it's, it's a very natural feeling. You, yeah. you have a, a drone or you don't. It's based either on, yeah, on what you're doing in the text yeah. or it's just based on the melodical shapes. And, uh, and that, so then organum um, created the necess necessity to, to notate mm. rhythms and then... Yeah, but the music that's then written after that, yeah, and including then my show, and um, um, that leads, uh, then it leads to our subtilior, where rhythm is confused to the maximum maximum degree. Um, in other words, um, the idea that yeah, of one, two, three, four, um, or a pulsating rhythm, yeah, basically was not part of the of the musical aesthetics, mm -hmm. uh, at least of art music. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the, you know. Uh, in the in the tavern, yeah, uh, we don't know. We have no idea about that. Mm. And yeah, it's possible that they have rhythmical music there, but certainly in art music in the church uh, or in chanson, it is not there. It's not there in Machot. It's not there in anybody uh, in the whole of the 14th century. Mm. And it's only in the 15th century that that begins to you, know, you get a strong simplification of the uh, of the rhythmical. Uh, complexity mm -hmm. uh, 
but as far as I see it is, you know, in musical history, the first time that you actually can say there is simple sort of you know, bum, 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 beam, bum, 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 these sort of homo, you know, homo rhythmic music. Yeah. Uh, it happens with the frotto line in Italy. You know? So then by that time, you're sort of way into the 15th century. And what's the, the frotto line? Yeah, that's sort of, uh, those are songs, uh, but with... with uh, ensemble songs with sung with four people together or with just one voice and uh, and, and a lute or uh, but have these yeah, typical simple yeah, simple rhythms um, where yeah that you could you know, identify more with something like percussion right because because before that um, if we're talking about this style called a subtilio which is it is the most sort of um, far out. Yeah, music there is it's certainly from this period but even even in general you can say it's when you when you listen to it you sometimes it's so the, the parts are so rhythmically independent that you you don't even hear no, you, a sense of pulse let alone yeah. um, you let alone play it you know it's, it's just not it's not perceptible in any way so how would you how would you sort of describe the rhythmic identity of 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 that music in and how does it link up with the evolution of notational systems which were of course completely experimented with and and very individual according to composers there was very little standardization right i would say what it what it is probably its most characteristic uh the, the driving force isn't uh is pushing polyphony to its extremes. Mm. Uh, I think that was the first drive yeah, behind it. Mm. Um, so already you know, I talked about the fact that the three voices in a three-part structure have very different uh, characters. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have this tenor part and you would have the contra tenor, you would have the melody, the cantus part. Uh, and they, they show extreme yeah, differences in um, in approach, probably instrumentation. Um, and yeah, what Arcipelier does is just drive these yeah, three voices yeah, in different directions yeah, as much uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So there was there was a hunger for to to what do you say to um, yeah look for the extremes in 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 polyphony. Mm. It's like the the whole early history of the uh, of Western music there, from the from the invention of polyphony to that point is some sort of a feverish exploration of this newly found. Uh, but you know, of course, of course it was, because it is it's a one of the single uh, events in which Western culture is different from any. Musical culture is different from any other culture yeah, on the on the planet. Mm. I mean, the way that that uh, took off and mm. became a completely uh, new language yeah. uh, is uh, that's that's unique, mm. and I think that that's the reason why it was the, 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 it was such an explosion. Uh, mm. um, How on earth did they play? I mean, <coughs> so, play play the the most complex pieces it feels like they're notational exercises sometimes the the music is so so impossible to synchronize or so complex it feels like almost like a like an experiment where the sound becomes less important than the actual writing of it and the following through of some some notational concept or some idea would you agree with that well, that's coming back to what something you mentioned er earlier. Um, it's the question of was this music first written down and then played, or was it first you know, played and then written down? Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, I'm still yeah, pretty convinced that uh, the musicians yeah, under scrutiny here which were the composers, musicians uh, working in these uh, in this field mm. you know, and being feverishly, mm. you know, into this, into this world or mm. in this world, 
Um, they were capable of of incredible mm-hmm. tour de force, yeah, and and became you know, really extreme. Um, and the only way I can sort of you know, for myself uh, find proof in that is that once you know, yeah, after a long time, you know some of these pieces. Uh, really inside out, you know, and then there are the famous, like the famous Sumite Carissimi or the Grenu Bien, famous examples of uh, of pieces that musicologists considered to be uh, just pure theory, but oh, not music. Was hardly, well, not playable, and yeah. was not meant to be played, yeah. and was just musically completely meaningless. Uh-huh. Um, the only conclusion you can have, and this is again your musical instinct, mm-hmm. is. This music is so you know, is so refined and so intense you know, that actually you know I have that music completely in my head. You know I know I can without a score or anything. If uh, if somebody plays that music, I can tell you know can can tell in any moment you know, where the rhythm is wrong. Mm. Yeah, which seems impossible, mm. but it isn't. Mm. Yeah, you know? it gets into your ears, it gets yeah. into your brain, mm. and then you see the logic. Mm-hmm. Then you see that it is not some sort of an abstract exercise mm. uh, um, in 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 rhythm or in mathematics. <clears throat> but it is actually something that is so refined and, and distilled uh, yeah. that it takes, in the end, it takes that form and everything has its musical sense uh, in that. And it becomes completely logical. It becomes like, you know, just hyper expressive music. Yeah. It's, End uh, of story. It's so wonderful to listen to. It's totally fascinating because you feel like you don't know, you, you feel like you're lost, but you. You, you notice all all the connections both rhythmically and melodically and contrapuntally i would massively encourage people to go and listen to the album in particular there's one album that i love um which is shanti codex volume two they're all great but that's the one that first got, got me into this going, music yeah. so that's why i have a special feeling towards it um it's sort of it feels like music from another planet mm-hmm. but it's not <laughs>